All right, welcome in Juicy Saturday Slate on the Diamond. And we don't have a ton of time to get through it all, so we're going to dive into some leans, maybe even a lock or two, depending on how we feel, depending on what we think, depending on what pops up in front of us. Let's dive into it. You already know the drill. We ask you, please, to hit the thumbs up button and subscribe here, of course, to our YouTube channel. It's ever-growing YouTube channel. We do this seven days a week. I'm here on the weekend. Lindy's here Monday through Friday. Yeah, we're on the Discord. We want you on the Discord. We absolutely want you on the Discord. But we've got bigger things to talk about, at least some bets to talk about, right? As I mentioned, a lot of games on the slate. Let's open up early on right now in New York. Tyler Molly versus Domingo Herman, And you can look at a couple of things. Maybe it's just Molly being the better pitcher, more consistent, less walks, more strikeouts. Maybe it's just what we've seen, you know, this volatility so far in this series. Whatever it is, I, I think to just focus on Molly would be a mistake. Domingo Herman is hittable, and the Yankees are hitting. So when you look at that combination, at least the combination for me, there's a pretty big or decent element that I think you can continue to point to as the Yankees smash away. So, we know, of course, that offense, not as prevalent, maybe, on Friday night as it was leading up to that. But there was a little difference, right, of a pitching matchup. In this case, we're just going to open up. We're going to lean over eight and a half. Again, the biggest factor in why we're going over eight and a half, why we can get to nine runs. Domingo Herman, we believe, is hittable here by Minnesota. And the Yankees are going to out-hit how good Tyler Molly is going to be. Look, the Ks are up so far. The walks are down. I understand that. But this is a really difficult lineup. Healthy, everybody out there, assuming on Saturday, to navigate through or around. And that's why we like over, at least, here, eight and a half. We move on. So, Pittsburgh at St. Louis. This thing has been bizarre, to say the least. The expectation, I, I think, at the very start of this series did not go according to plan. The blanking, the early blanking of St. Louis in games is mind-boggling. But look, Pittsburgh's good. This year, at least, they're 8-5 and five coming into the night last night. So when people are like, oh, my God, I can't believe that they beat the Cardinals on the road in St. Louis— Pittsburgh at the time was seven and five coming into that game. They improved to eight and five. That doesn't mean they've got St. Louis's number. That doesn't mean that they're going to turn this thing into a massacre. But you've got Contreras versus Mats on the hill. And that's probably the best place to start here and say, all right, which one of these guys is going to allow his team to either break out or revert back to normal? Bats come around for Mats. I think there's no problem here at all. And that's the answer to your question. So I love the St. Louis Cardinals not only turning this around, but also getting some offense as a result of it. Being able to hit Contreras, knowing that you, you can be patient. He's not going to strike you out. 11% K rate this year so far. It's atrocious. You're not going to get much as far as blowing you back. Look, you don't take anything away from Pittsburgh. They're winning games. But... In this case, let's lock up the St. Louis Cardinals. Minus one and a half on the run line. All right, let me tell you what's happening at Bet365. 21 or older, gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. New Jersey, Colorado, Ohio, Virginia. If you're in these states and you haven't taken advantage of what we're doing on Bet365, this is now on you. You're losing money because it's so simple. You can turn a dollar into $200 or a dollar in anything, knowing you're going to get $200. You want to put a massive parlay down? Go ahead. It will take you 60 seconds to sign up, probably less than deposit 10 bucks and bet a buck on anything and watch 200 pop right back into your account. So easy. It's, it's amazing how seamless this is. All right, let's go to Washington, D.C. Let's go to the nation's capital. Hey, Chad Cool is on the hill against Dan Plezak. And while you're up in the air, about this series from a who's starting, who's starting standpoint. Washington quietly coming around and holding at least Cleveland.
for the most part in this game Friday night. Just just holding. And that's all this was. You're trying to eliminate mistakes. You're trying to eliminate extra base hits. You're trying to eliminate Cleveland just simply wearing you down. And you've got, it's not, it's never, I should say, going to be a comfortable situation for the most part. Every now and again, you get a, a gray in there. But for the most part, with a Washington Nationals pitcher, you don't have much of a K rate. You do have a high walk rate. But Zach Plezak, I think, the thing about Zach Plezak in this game, I think he dominates. And it's not even from a K rate standpoint where you're not going to get a, a significant amount of strikeouts. I think that's going to feed into Washington, but you're also going to keep guys off the bag. This is ultimately going to be another lower scoring game, save some sort of crazy breakout in the end, which I don't see. So I lean under here, under nine in Washington for this total. All right, let's move to Milwaukee, San Diego, out in out west in San Diego. And, and this is another one, too, where it's been a theme and will continue, I'm sure. Freddie Peralta is on the hill. So you look at this game, think, all right, what, what does Milwaukee have to do in order to win this baseball game? Like, where are the Brewers right now? This has been a later start. You turn around. It's a little earlier in the day here for San Diego. It's not like they've crossed multiple time zones, et cetera. It's just it's an earlier day. But what exactly needs to happen for Milwaukee to win again and survive, even though they had to get around, survive, withstand, what have you, Eric Lauer? What needs to happen? It's it's another strong pitching performance. Freddie Peralta has to follow up on dominating and striking guys out because that's what he's been doing at an incredible clip. Seth Lugo is not to be scoffed at by any means, but this is where Milwaukee can break out. Milwaukee can take a little bit of a risk. Milwaukee, you'll see, they're, they're going to have more scoring opportunities, probably more hitting opportunities. And Peralta with any lead is a side I want to be on. Plus 105 here for the Milwaukee Brewers. And I'm going to lean that road dog, but we're tailing Freddie Peralta here. That's essentially what's going on. We move on. Let's go to Oakland, hosting the Mets. Not a lot of people, I think, are going to... I don't know if this is going to be unpopular or not. I shouldn't say that and just demand that it's coming across contrarian, etc. But look. The thing for me in this game when it comes to pitching, and it's not even anything specific with Fujinama. It's just his numbers aren't there. And, and like both of these guys, my God, both of these guys just want to walk. Carlos Carrasco's on the hill. He's got a 16.7% walk rate, which is second to Fujinama's. I mean, Fuji, Fujinama is atrociously awful. I've got the alliteration from the guy in the Paw Patrol. Neither one of these guys is striking anybody out. Neither one of these guys are keeping anybody off the bag when it comes to walks. So there's enough pop in this Mets lineup, at least. What, what do you want to avoid runs? I mean, even Oakland. Again, it's a little easier to score runs when you get guys walked on the base path. And I don't even think Carrasco's pitching around anybody. Is It's just a difficult outing so far for him where that walk rate is. Now, short sample size, only a couple of games for all these guys. I get it, but it's it's not, it hasn't worked itself out quite yet. And maybe it does to an extent against Oakland, but not at the expense of this total. So we'll lean over nine here. Now, how many times have we mentioned when you've got an opportunity for Chris Bubich at home and his Royals team is a dog. Now, we don't blindly bet it, but we like to. This is a difficult team here in Atlanta. You can see how hot they get fast. Charlie Morton on Saturday. It, it's just tough when you've got guys consistently pitching with the lead. It's not any easier, per se, with Bryce Elder. Well, it's a little easier. But it's still tough, right? It's really still tough. 
the problem that you face when you're looking at this game is you don't give Bubich enough respect. You don't. You disrespect. You deride. You derail plays. Ah, I don't trust it. Uh, they are a short 125 home dog. Because, as I mentioned, in order to beat this team, in order to hold off Atlanta and survive Elder, who's got a decent, pretty good K rate, let me say that, you have to be perfect or close to it. And so far, Bubich has been that. He's not walking anybody. Nobody. So the Braves now are really going to have to earn this and have to work for this. And there's going to be some luxuries that you can take. Maybe some risks is probably a better way to put it. I'm telling you, Royals at home, home dog. I get it. Atlanta is coming in the better team, if you will, like top to bottom. Assuming, again, no days off. That's why we do this early and lean. But I don't see a reason to fade Bubich more so than anything else. That's really what it is. I, I don't see a reason to truly fade Bubich. The Braves can just pound the Royals into the dust, which they did, but it doesn't happen this time around. That's a lock. Go ahead. That's a lock. I like where we are here. Let's move to Cincinnati. Notice a trend that's been going on here. This trend specifically about high scoring games expected at great American smalls and not getting that, at least not getting that consistently. These two teams, once again, played to a lower scoring game from the total, at least heading into, you know, that game later. I don't know. I don't think you can really extract much from games kind of hovering around this total. The Phillies are still strikeout happy. I, I know that it wasn't like you're going up against a guy that just doesn't strike people out. Outside of that, hey, man. This Phillies team has a burst or two, but they don't wear pitchers down like they used to. They just don't. They have an inning where they can get hot, but they don't attack and just slowly, methodically disintegrate you. It's a little different this time around, right? Because you've got Graham Ashcroft, Ashcraft, I always want to call him Ashcroft, and Matty Stram on the hill. I think Ashcraft is enough to stabilize this total and keep this thing rather low. Here's the thing about Stram. He's he's striking some people out. Strom. He's striking some people out. I have no, no problem with Ashcraft. This is a great matchup here for him. So we just look at this game and go under. It's a lean, but we go under here. Mainly because we trust that these two pitchers are probably going to get a K or two more than expected. And both have been fine getting out of jams so far, at least. Look, you want to look at the results, that's different. I'm looking at what's the pitching stats, not the win-loss shit. So under nine in Cincinnati is our lean. Let's move to Boston. Fenway. Hey, I know it didn't work, or it doesn't always work, I should say, where it's expected offense, expected runs. I mean, my God, you're in Fenway. You're in Fenway. Slow. Sometimes it's slow, right? That total was nine Saturday, uh, Friday night between the Angels and Red Sox. And I want to go right back to it. It's it, For us, it closed at nine. Wherever you got it, that's fine. But it's already, the look ahead, it's already at nine and a half. So you see, whatever you want to take away from Friday's game wasn't a true impact into this total because we're right back at nine and a half. In this case, it's nine and a half. Just, just a little low for that hook. I don't think we get bit by the hook. This is a close. This is close to ten. Too close to ten here. Different seven and a half, seven, something along those lines. Over nine and a half is a convincing play. It's minus one hundred five. So there's a little bit of a risk. I understand that, but you have to look at this from where we are in this setting here. Fenway, the pitching matchup doesn't scream. Oh my god. Oh my god. Everybody is going to struggle to hit. Right? Like I, I know you immediately look and say, well, okay, well, shit. Is it? Is it Otani? No, it's not. It's, it's Tyler Anderson. Okay, well then, it's fine. Nick Pavetta, though. You know, how hittable is Nick Pavetta right now? K-rate's there, but nothing else really is. Feast or famine on the strikeouts. I don't know if I want to live by that on a total. I'd rather bank on the bats swinging. I'd rather bank on both Anderson 
and Pavetta at times just being victimized. Well, way more at Tyler Anderson. Way more. But Pavetta's going to have his moments, too. So we lean over nine and a half. All right, we move to Miami here. Marlins hosting the D-backs, and you can get as excited as you like for this sucker here, right? I mean, this is just can't miss baseball. Marlins are 500 coming into this. The Diamondbacks fall to eight and six, just like you called it at the start of the year, right? Now... The pitching matchup changes just a little bit. And you see, well, what what's attackable with these two guys? Really, when you start to open this series up, because last night, okay. But now you've got Nelson and Garrett is right back, Braxton Garrett. So, you know, Ryan Nelson, nothing, nothing at all to be worried about. But... I don't think Miami is going to be able to take advantage of it. I don't think you're going to get a lot of runs. You just saw this eight and a half, by the way, is a decent number just to get to for Miami, despite having a pretty favorable pitching matchup going up against Nelson. The thing about Garrett, no walks. We talked about that like Bubich earlier, but he just doesn't have the K rate for it. I still don't think either one of these teams, we just saw this with Arizona. That's a trend that I think continues right into tonight. I don't think you're going to get a lot of offense. You're just not. These two guys, at least on the side of Garrett, no walks, but giving up some hits, a K or two there. It's not dominant enough, I get it, to just blank a team, but I don't think Arizona's talented enough, despite their record, to jump on this, especially because they're not going to get a break like a couple of walks. And on the other side, the K rate, the walk rate, it's just atrocious. I, I mean, that, that's the theme word, by the way. It's like Pee Wee's Playhouse. When you hear that word, all the shit comes down. I'm not buying into Nelson so much as I'm buying in the inability of Miami to take advantage of Nelson. So we will go under eight and a half. Rangers. Texas Rangers. Ooh, on the money line. How about that? They're at Houston. Houston just, just isn't quite there yet. I don't think anybody really believes that they're destined for disappointment this year. I mean, more so you can look at, I think, the Phillies of the two teams who were in the World Series and question whether or not they get it back. But I don't think that there's long-term concern for Houston. It's just, man, they played a lot of baseball over the last couple of years. And you come out in this type of sport recognizing, hey, 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 we're going to be out here for a little bit. And if you're not full pack, the young sprung rookies or young players on the team, you, you get that veteran malaise, if you will. People like to call it the World Series, Super Bowl, whatever, hangover. Eh, that's fine. Rangers 7-5, and 3-1. and one. Coming into last night, I should say. And what I love about this game, they're getting just a little bit, just a little bit, 150 on the road at Houston. Why? Why exactly is this happening? It doesn't scream to me that Houston has figured anything out. You don't have, for example, one, I mean, let's, you know, you've got Hunter Brown on the hill who has pitched great to contact absolutely has pitched fantastic to contact he's not he's got some strikeout in him too but he'll make a mistake he'll walk you he'll walk a couple guys he, he's got some mistake in him and a savvy team can take advantage of that john gray on the other hand well <laughs> you know texas is probably gonna have to provide some offense to out hit a mistake or two on that end and that's fine for me I like where Texas has been. The additions that we've seen to this lineup, they should be, they match up fine. Not necessarily fantastic, but they match up fine against Hunter Brown for me. I'm rolling Texas Rangers on the money line plus 150. All right, a couple more to go. I want to hit you up though real quick on the Discord. We're doing it on the Discord. Half off your first week. ES Insider is the code. Again, half off your first week. Did I mention ES Insider, the code? Yeah? Cool. Do you want to see some fun stuff? This is what we've been doing. Home run props. It's 
more home run props somewhere here. Here we go. Tuesday night, last Tuesday night dinger was Schwarber bomb. And yep, no need, no need. No need to collect on anything. Keep it moving here with the Cleveland Cavs. Oh, you're here for baseball? Don't worry, don't worry. I got you for NBA too. Not one, but two parlays at the same. Also, Cavs, yeah, they led us to that. Yeah, they did that. See, you did it. Congrats. Hunter Renfo, yeah. We did that too. We did a lot of cool stuff on the Discord over the past week, and I just want to make sure that you see it. All right, final couple of games. Dodgers hosting the Cubs. What are you getting out of this? Truly, what are you getting out of this? Do you have anything at all that you can point to Jamison Tyon and say, the Cubs, they got a shot. The Chicago Cubs with the guy who, when it comes to just holding off opposing batters is fine better than serviceable fine but i also don't think you're gonna get a gigantic dominate performance either and that's what you would need this this lineup michael grove is not gonna kill you by any means he's okay he's fine there too both of these guys are just fine there isn't a noticeable i think advantage when you look at the pitcher combined with the matchup don't think you get that noticeable advantage. So I'm fine here playing into the heavier juice and laying the 165 with the Dodgers on the money line. Lean. It's a big ass, but it's a lean. All right, we're in Seattle here. You know what happens in Seattle when Colorado comes to town? We are going under. Why are we going under? First off, that total is at eight. That's fine. I don't anticipate this thing moving much. The Rockies, this has been a trend, a theme to where if they can't take advantage of anything on the inside, which is Coors Field, what the hell are you expecting to happen on the outside? Like when they go hit the road, nothing. They're dead. They're cooked. They're iced out. Put them in a box, Jimmy or Kirby. George Kirby has mind control over you. George Kirby's not going to strike you out, but he's not going to walk you either. And you know he's not going to walk you. So why do you think he's going to walk you? Why do you try to go up and think he's going to get you? There's no walking involved here. There's no walking in baseball when George Kirby's on the hill. Yeah, they may not be striking out, but there's no there's no walking. Come on. You, you don't have much for the Rockies. You've got a guy that is totally feast or famine in Feltner when it comes to possible strikeout, hitting to contact, and walks. It's a freaking slot machine. You don't know what's coming out. But I think he's able, On again, on the road, I don't trust the Rockies to score much. I don't think it flips over to Seattle either. You get one night, one night for Feltner here, in which he can just stay just control his shit for just, just a little bit and you'll be in great shape. And I think you go under eight. That's our third final lock of the night. All right. Thanks again for hanging with us. As always, thumbs up, subscribe. We're back looking at Sunday's schedule. We do this each and every day. Likes and leans and locks and everything in between. See ya.